maybe I'd start off uh, before I get into sort of a couple remarks about sort of how do we get here and where are we going. Um, maybe share with you a few thoughts on on a uh, a recent uh, trip that I took to Taiwan as a part of a delegation about three weeks ago, so about two weeks after Speaker Pelosi's visit, uh, and to kind of give you some of my main observations. Uh, as that might spur some questions as we go on and, and, and a conclusion I made about kind of where I think we are. So, so I have kind of three observations as I, as I came out of Taiwan. Um, one, that the, the Chinese Communist Party's threat to Taiwan is becoming far more acute and the challenge of deterring the PRC uh, is, is becoming much more difficult, though not impossible. Um, number two, the Taiwanese people are impressively resilient uh, they possess a vibrant democracy uh, that is worthy of our respect, and they are served by talented and dedicated individuals uh, in the public and private sectors across the political spectrum. Uh, so had a chance to meet with both the ruling DPP, the, the Democratic People's Party, uh, as well as, as the KMT, the, 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 the Kuomintang, and, and, and the TPP, the Taiwan People's Party, and I was incredibly impressed with the, with the level and commitment of the individuals they have kind of serving their democracy. Um, and last observation is that Taiwan is increasingly isolated in the world due to Beijing's intransigence. Reversing this trend is critical to deterring the PRC from attacking Taiwan. This requires both symbolic and substantive assistance on the part of the United States and other countries like Japan. My main conclusion coming out of this is that for, for the longest period of time, uh, the assumption of what Beijing's intent was towards Taiwan was that they were pursuing a policy of deterring Taiwan's formal independence, right? That that, that that had long been their goal, essentially maintain the status quo, and the status quo being essentially de facto independence, and that Beijing simply didn't want Taiwan to move closer towards formal independence. But increasingly, it's, I think it's become clear, and I, I am now very much convinced that Beijing has shifted to a policy of compelling reunification through annexation. This may sound like a subtle shift, but what it means is that, that Beijing has essentially changed its direction on what it's pursuing with Taiwan. And therefore, I think we need to be very mindful that, that since the, the conditions have changed, right, the, you know, as you know, to paraphrase John Maynard Keynes, you know, when, when geopolitical polit ge geopolitics change, you know, you have to change your foreign policies. We probably have to think about our own changes uh, given, given those, those shifts. Um, so I thought maybe I'd start with a kind of few observations or a few sort of thoughts about how did we get from where we were in the 1970s as we established relations with the People's Republic to where we are now, which, to be honest, you know, as I looked at, at the New York Times this morning, uh, Jane Perlez, the former Beijing bureau chief, you know, had, had a headline that is essentially that, that, that we're in a Cold War now. And I think that that is an accurate representation of sort of where we are today. So how did we kind of get here? How did this happen? What, what has been going on? Um, and I think that you know, the way I would put it is that the United States, um, from, a, from a policy perspective, has gone through three phases of our relationship with the People's Republic. Um, and those phases, starting in the sort of mid to early 1970s, uh, and then up to today, uh, color for us the options of what we have into the future. Uh, so the first phase I think of is really a relationship based upon Cold War calculus. Um, you know, if you'll remember, you know, in the way back times, uh, you have a Sino-Soviet split, you know, which is really caused by, by Nikita Khrushchev's secret speech in which he denounces Stalin and the excesses of, of personality cults um, and, and begins to move the Soviet Union in a, a, a different direction than what Stalin had pursued. And Mao Zedong, uh, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party and, 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 and the PRC, uh, views this as an affront to himself. Um, and it begins a, a break inside the communist bloc. This had not been the first break, obviously, within the communist bloc. Tito had also 
uh, broken with, with Stalin in the, in, the 19, in the late 1940s, and the United States had sought to take advantage of that split between Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union by establishing closer relations with Yugoslavia and beginning to split the communist world. Um, and obviously the United States begins to pursue this again um, as the Sino-Soviet split becomes quite acute. You know, in 1969 they fight a, a, a small border war, um, and the United States begins under, under the leadership of, of, of President Nixon uh, to reestablish relations with the, with the PRC, with the full intent from an American perspective of bringing the PRC on side against the Soviet Union and placing the Soviet Union under more dilemmas for them to have to deal with. And that is the, the rationale, right? That's, that's, that's the reason why the United States goes into that relationship. It's the reason why the United States makes some compromises, you know, the, the most important one being its relationship with the Republic of China in Taiwan uh, by, by withdrawing recognition in 19, you know, January 1979 and extending that recognition uh, to the PRC and ending its formal defense treaty. But then we have the passage of the Taiwan Relations Act, which shows that there is a, the United States has a bit of a different understanding of what that one China policy really means. Um, but that, that, re, that sort of situation, that Cold War calculus, obviously lasts until the end of the Cold War. Uh, so when the Soviet Union falls, um, there is a search for what is the new rationale of that relationship. Um, and, and I think this is a critical sort of turn. So if we take ourselves back to 1991, and I would say between sort of 1991 and the collapse of the Soviet Union, and, and May of 1994, when, 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 when President Clinton sort of announces sort of this new policy of encouraging economic development inside the PRC through engagement, and then hoping to drive political liberalization, that being the sort of the new phase, that's the new strategic approach, that that is based upon sort of a hopeful look that, that fundamentally we are watching communist parties around the world implode, and if the Chinese Communist Party is seeking to reach out to the, to the liberal West uh, in order to reform its economy and begin to do a few things, we should embrace that and help them you know, move along a peaceful evolution to become, you know, pl through political liberalization, to become a, a, you know, what Robert Zolik calls in, in, in 2005, a responsible stakeholder in the broader international system. And this serves as sort of our approach for, you know, from 1994 through about 2015 or so, 2015, 2016. And it's that point in time where that, that relationship begins to fray to a, to a, to a large degree and a, and a debate happens really in the last few months of the Obama administration to shift to strategic competition. And, and to a certain degree, we see that happen explicitly with the publishing of a national security strategy in December of 2017 by the Trump administration but this had been sort of in train for quite some time, largely because Xi Jinping had moved the Chinese Communist Party and the PRC in a very different direction. And that's what sort of puts us into strategic rivalry. Um, and, it, and, and maybe I'll, I'll, you know, my last couple of comments before I, I pass on to Josh, um, you know, I think we could rightly ask the question of why does this happen? Why does the PRC begin to move in this direction towards strategic rivalry. Um, and I think it's largely because the party views the United States uh, as the bulwark of an existential threat to their own rule. They view a liberal international system as something that threatens the existence of the Chinese Communist Party. And therefore, they have to pursue an ideological fight and really mobilize themselves to be able to sort of fight back against what we represent. And that has been the dynamic. Uh, that we've seen sort of unfold over the last sort of decade. Um, and I suspect it is the dynamic that we'll continue to see sort of going on in the future. Um, so maybe I'll end with sort of how should we respond, and we can kind of get into this into questions. Um, so I think we need both an inside game and an outside game, right? And by an inside game, I mean that in the terms of, of a, 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 an improvement of our own position, um, both from a, from, a, uh, uh, from a strategic position with, with other allies and partners around the world that share some of our same views about an, a system that we want to keep, uh, but also an inside games in terms of helping our own country to be able to better itself and improve its own competitive advantages to be able to compete over the long term. And an outside game of placing our 
adversary at a disadvantage, kneecapping their position in the world to make them less competitive over time and to, and to feed upon and to accentuate vulnerabilities that already exist within their system. Um, you know, that inside and outside game um, in reality is, is essentially a, a cold war and that's I think what we're in. Um, and it requires us to sort of think that way as we look at our policy options into the future. Uh, so with that, maybe I'll stop uh, and turn it over to Josh.